principle. So that's fantastic. Okay. Doug, over to you. Thanks, Francis. And good evening, or whatever time of day it is, everyone. <clears throat> and, uh, and greetings from the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, my name is Doug Clark. I'm an associate professor and right now assistant director academic in our university school of environment and sustainability. Um, I'm a kind of a moderator slash panelist tonight and uh, I, I, I would just like to uh, be part of, of setting this, uh, this public event up in a, in a really good way. Um, so as we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that as we gather here today, both uh, here and virtually from wherever, we acknowledge that the University of Saskatchewan campus is on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, we pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationships with one another. And wherever you're joining from, uh, please perhaps just take a moment to think about the Indigenous ancestors and present inhabitants of, uh, of those places. And it is a, a very distinct pleasure to introduce to you uh, to, to, to help us open this event in a good way, Joseph Natejo. Uh, Joseph is uh, an elder and a knowledge keeper from the Sturgeon Lake First Nation. Uh, I've worked with him a little bit on campus and uh, some other colleagues of mine have worked more extensively with him. Uh, Joseph is very much a, a leader and a mentor to a lot of people at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he's a multi-talented individual and has been recognized nationally for his music, uh, cultural, and linguistic achievements. And uh, Joseph, with that, uh, I, I'd, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm using the power of the south and the power of the north, you know, the, the uh, what do you call that, that? The biggest bird down south, it's called a, uh, my brain is not working too well these days, you know, I'm just suffering from shingles. It's affecting everything in my body. But this is a white spotted eagle, condor. So put these, and get them scat now, I can ask them now. Omotom, kautuhtian neotakikawi noaski, treaty six, egomina. Treaty four, treaty five, treaty eight. You're gonna go, I'm going to stump. You know, yeah, I'm going to ask So just uh, acknowledging the previous nations that were here that we struggled with before European arrival. But I'll do a. Just uh, lately, this song has been coming, and it has to do with. Uh, a bird, and I think in this song it's like a thunderbird. Anything that goes comes from from up in the sky and comes down. It has to do with either eagle or thunderbird, and uh, it's a chicken dance song. But because it's a chicken dance song from our ceremony, what we call Pihu Simon Gamona, Pihu Simon, or grouse dance ceremony. It doesn't mean that the songs are all about the grouse. The, on the contrary, they're actually more about just uh, grandfathers and grandmothers, what we call, which are connected to the four directions. And also, any any uh, spirit beings that are connected to those elements and animals. So anything that has a, an animal or earth, air, wind, sky, water connection. We call them uh, grandmothers and grandfathers. So we recognize them as that. They're very personal to us. So when we call on them, we're just asking for guidance in whatever we do, conversation, and whatever we do in terms of trying to help rebalance this uh, earth, rebalance the land. And we call them Atuskayagana, the ones that work. So this is a song of one, I would say more in context with water, water beings, you know, anything to do with water, the ocean, lakes, rivers. So this song would be about 
our twin, the Thunderbird, coming to help us. So this is uh, how it goes, and I'll just do that cappella. Hey, oh, hey. Short invocation, just a few comments. Climate change, earth, air. Water, fire. You can know again out of Skyagna, case in Stotemak. In an Apache Sigitic. You go mean a D. Into the Magis Magiac. Papiatic. In an Apache that's a gumki cow in Oski. You go, Omomi no motogram, Scotsagati, go motic ski, the Moktan Sumati Suipak. In Iso, we go to Nauku Magnet University of Saskatchewan. We go to Canada. Kichik Snomato Gumgo Universities of Canada. We still get to Scottaqua. I'm still talking about some guys who are back home. Then she is a bit in a wago tinigan. Magumi was Magakia no, can he hear we are? I take a skate, you know, Mago Topo Gagi somewhere. So welcome Eric and uh, whoever else is on panel. And uh, I was just saying in the context of uh, like um, what people are doing and I know that uh, all universities across do all kinds of research, you know, of, on uh, What's going on with the planet, you know, and the climate? And uh, the same thing goes for indigenous people. The only maybe they maybe the difference might be we we go into ceremony. Like for example, we we uh, prepare for this summer to uh, be dancing to the land, to be singing to the land, to be praying for anyone you know who's uh, had suffering. You know we fast for days, four days, or four more, four days, four nights. So people are all preparing for that. I, as a singer, I do sweat lodge ceremonies, so that's how my my uh, role is understood in the community. People know I do sweats, you know, and people who need help, whether it's, uh, you know, suffering of any kind, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, that's when we, you know, that's when I come into play. I just become a helper in that way, and I pray for people who've lost someone. But at the same time, we also pray to the land. Kekawi no aski. Kekawi no meaning mother, aski being our mother, you know, being our earth, mother earth. 
So we always reference Mother Earth and four directions before we even undertake you know, praying for other people. We always connect with those ancestry, you know, that particular source of energy that's uh, constant. And we know, like, uh, have a little conversation with Doug there that uh, we call them helpers. And the helpers, as we know, earth, wind, water, and fire are very active in terms of uh, what's happening throughout the planet. And we see it as a cleansing. And I've heard this many years ago, back in the 70s, I heard an old man stop me in my first year of university, and then I was uh, very ill-equipped as an indigenous man at that time. I had no knowledge of my culture. I was 20 years old. I just came fresh out of university, and I just was learning to become a phys ed teacher. And uh, just a little side note there, when I was in Goose Bay in uh, in New Territory, I was invited to go to a training that they were doing there with a circus company from New York. And I, uh, <laughs> I was really, uh, I thought, oh, that's cool, circus, you know, and you are into the circus. And so I went there and helped them out to do some storytelling. And that's my connection with uh, your territory over there, Eric, you know, the place that you're working. And it's, uh, I just found it really in interesting that they were into circus uh, training. Kids wouldn't come out till about 11 or 12, you know, they were all sleeping away. So we were all, circus was just organizing and putting everything together in the gymnasium. <laughs> and then uh, I came there as a storyteller also, I was a participant. So that's my experience over there. And their language is not that much different than ours over here, Algonquin. You know, it's Cree and Nihewiwin and Innu are very similar. They can understand some of the words. There was one word I was saying over and over again. They kept laughing at me. And that same word we use for cannibal, which is uh, also a cleansing, more devastating uh, um, creature in our culture. That You don't want to mess with that, that creature. And a lot of artists, for some reason, they work with that entity. And we never allow anybody to come and take cloth or print to our sweat lodge to say, can you help us to pray for this cannibal, this ca devastating spirit? And we just say, no, we don't do that. That's not what we work with. That's a devastating spirit. You don't work with that spirit. And I was using that word, and they were laughing. For them, that word means uh, like a, like a, your, your asshole. You know, that's what they, <laughs> that's their word for. <laughs> and so they were laughing at my storytelling. That's talking about this cannibal. <laughs> so that's my experience over there. But uh, I'd like to welcome you here to this territory in Treaty 6. And I included the other, the other uh, treaties in this area because we know each other and then we know our boundaries. We know our territories. So we just know where to go and where not to go to hunt or fish or trap. You know, we just keep keep those lines very close. You know, it's just they know they can tell when you're in their territory. If you're in some work spiritually, if you're connected that way. So with that, I'll uh, welcome you all and, uh, and uh, look forward to this conversation. I'm really interested, fascinated with what you're going to be talking about. Thank you for inviting well, me. Thank you very much, uh, Elder Joseph. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Abraham. I'm the uh, president of the Canadian Meteorological Oceanographic Society. And thank you for your powerful song uh, that connected us with the water in the ocean and the prayer that certainly connected us with uh, Mother Earth. Really important components of what we in the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society deal with in our, in our work. I have the pleasure of, um, of welcoming everybody uh, to, uh, uh, to the public talk. Um, before I get to Eric, I'd like to um, um, introduce uh, Dr. Robert Way. Um, Robert is uh, of Inuit descent from central Labrador, and he's currently a, a lead professor in the Northern Environmental Geoscience Laboratory at Queen's University in, in Ontario, although like many professors, he's teaching remotely. Um, 
As an indigenous uh, northerner, uh, Robert's experiences and relationships with community have had profoundly shaped the 10 plus years that he's been working on issues related to climate change in Labrador. So after uh, Eric's talk, Robert, Doug, and Joseph will share some of their own experiences based on the work that Eric is going to share with us shortly. Eric is a assistant professor of physical oceanography at Dalhousie University. He is also of Inuit descent and with roots in Nunatsiavut, which is Northern Labrador. And he's interested in the indigenous perspectives on climate, water, weather, oceans, and the under understanding of both the indigenous and scientific knowledge of these systems. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eric, who's gonna share that perspective with us. Afterwards, we're gonna have some time for questions and answers. Si vous voulez poser des questions en français, utilisez le QAO, use the Q&A to answer any, ask any questions. And I'd be happy to share the questions with Eric or any of the panelists um, after our initial discussion. Over to you, Eric, thank you. Thanks, Jim, for the introduction. And, uh, and thank you, Joseph, for that, that welcoming. That was really nice. Um, I was wondering what time of year you were up there and the fact that up in, in Goose Bay, the fact that you came with positive, positive um, impressions, you must not have been there during black fly season, I guess. <laughs> no, good, yeah. Um, I'll share my screen now. And I'll look for Jim to nod to make sure you can see it fine. Good. All right. So um, I'm going to speak on um, bridging bridging knowledge systems, um, Inuit and scientific knowledge of the coastal ocean and sea ice in Nunatsiavut. And uh, for those of you who are at the science lecture back in March, this will be fairly similar to that talk, uh, a bit abbreviated in places, but we'll have more time at the end for discussion. So what do I mean when I'm, when I'm saying bridging, bridging these knowledge systems? So science and Inuit both have ways of knowing, um, which are with a rich understanding of climate and the ocean and sea ice. And these understandings are distinct from each other and independent, but also complementary. Um, they have different ways of say categorizing that world the ocean likes to silo things into different disciplines and the language with which that is understood is, is usually mathematical um, science also likes to separate the natural world from how humans fit into that world and for the purposes of this slide i'll just say in general most generally speaking indigenous knowledge systems are much more rooted in the practice of a particular people in a particular place and the knowledge flows from that practice and so it's rooted in community and culture it's often held in a different form from science it's held perhaps in stories or other forms often by specific knowledge holders often elders and it's tied to the land and humans are very much a part of that of that understanding of, of the world um I'm going to give a positionality statement. Positionality is something that's common in social sciences, but it's less so in natural sciences. It's a way for a researcher to position themselves with respect to the research in terms of their identity, beliefs, and so on. Um, for the work that I'll speak about today, it makes sense to have a positionality statement from me. I am an academic and I'm an Inuk. Um, as an academic, I'm trained in natural science as a physical oceanographer. As an individual, I come from Labrador. My roots are in Nunatsiavut, and I grew up there and just outside the region. I'm Inuit from my father's side of the family, who come from Tigralic and Rocky Cove, which is just, just outside of the Rigolet area. And that, that's how I was raised. Half of my family is also settler Canadian, Canadian living across Canada, and my roots there are in the south shore of Nova Scotia. I feel I'm often able to understand both the Inuit and the settler perspectives of, the, of this country, or at least some, most aspects of both sides. I believe science is a powerful tool for understanding the world, and I've had great mentors all through my training and to this day. I've also learned from members of my community in Nunatsiavut, and I've experienced firsthand the depth of knowledge held by Inuit about their, the environment. So I believe that both scientific knowledge and Inuit knowledge can be used together to provide a joint understanding of our world. Um, 
I also want to recognize that I live in Southern Canada. I live in a city, I work at a university, and this gives me a certain privilege and power that I wish to use for the aims that I'm describing today and to benefit my communities in Nunatsiavut and also to benefit science. But I also recognize that within that system, within that system of science, there can be a pressure to, to be extractive from indigenous communities. Um, that pressure is strong and, and I do hope that if I become drawn in that way that I get called out on that by my colleagues and my community members. So I'm gonna talk about knowledge, scientific knowledge and Inuit knowledge. But I thought I would just briefly define what I mean by those things. So knowledge is a familiarity an awareness or an understanding of someone or something such as facts, skills or objects. And it can be acquired in many different ways and from many different sources. So um, deep ind independent thought or practice, for example. Science is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about our environment. Scientific observations of the environment, along with theories about how that system functions, together provide scientific knowledge in the, in the context that I'll be using it today. Inuit knowledge encompasses both, the way I'm defining it today, encompasses both traditional knowledge held by Inuit and also contemporary observation. So traditional knowledge is knowledge held by the community. It's an inherently multi-generational form of knowledge rooted in the culture and practice of Inuit of a particular place. And on the other hand, contemporary experiential observations are based on the narrative, narratives, anecdotes, comments, or stories of Inuit today, observing the world today, um, placed in the context of that traditional knowledge. This slide is what I'll call the what I call the ingredients slide. So I'm going to come back to this slide periodically throughout the talk. Um, so these are what I'm considering to be the different ingredients that make up this process of bridging knowledge systems. So from science, we have scientific observations, monitoring technology, scientific theory about how the system works. From Inuit knowledge, we have this multi-generational traditional knowledge as well as contemporary observations. And then we have aspects of the process of doing this kind of, both doing the uh, knowledge building exercises of either of either side, but also the process of bridging. So this would be relationships, relationship building, um, community and culture, activities that are based on the land, and boundary work. Now that last one I'm going to have to define a little bit. What, what do I mean by boundary work? That's a bit of jargon. So boundary work is working with boundary objects, and boundary objects are simply anything could be a concept, it could be actually an object, but something that exists in two different let's say knowledge systems that two different, say two different people with different worldviews, this thing, maybe it's sea ice, let's say, exists in both of those people's world worldviews. And so it acts as this pivot point from which the two worldviews can actually communicate to each other. And so acting, acting across that, but working across that boundary is a way that we can bridge. It's a point around which we can do this bridging work. So this is a map of, of Inuit Nunangat. These are the four Inuit self-governing regions in Northern Canada. Nunatsiavut is the Southern and easternmost one there in Northern Labrador. Um, this is a region experiencing dramatic warming due to polar amplification, which is very much expressed through changes in sea ice with a lo significant loss of sea ice, especially in the summer minimum, um, pole wide. And this is very important for Inuit as sea ice is uh, is our highway for the period of time, which is often substantial in the year when it exists. And it's a, it's a stable and, and very important way of accessing hunting grounds, fishing grounds, um, spiritual places, ancestral homes and cabins and so on. And so changes to it or its predictability are very important to me. This is a map of Labrador with uh, a highlighted, the subset of it that is Nunatsiavut highlighted in pink, red, and blue. Um, this, is a, this region lies on the western side of the North Atlantic under the influence of the Labrador Current. The Labrador Current dominates the oceanography in the region. Um, it flows southward along the coast, bringing relatively cold and fresh Arctic waters out of the north. And so the coastal waters of Nunatsiavut, which are so important for coastal ecosystems, um, are essentially Arctic derived. And so that's the, that's the context of the, of the coastal ocean system. The latitudes here are not 
really Arctic in the geographic sense. We're talking about 50 degrees north, but the continental landmass to the west and the influence of the Labrador Current to the east provide a climate that's much more um, Arctic-like for its latitude. Water temperatures are cool year round. You can see four seasonal snapshots of water temperatures in the yellow to purple colors. And sea ice shown in the blue colors um, persists for about six months of the year from December to June with a, a peak in March consisting of heavy pack ice right out to the, to the continental shelf. Now, I'm going to run through a few different uh, research activities that I've been involved in. Um, and, and in doing so, I'll come back to that ingredient slide and we'll talk about different kinds of ways that those ingredients can be combined. But I'm going to do a bit of a deeper dive into one of those activities first, and then I'll come back and do uh, a more cursory overview of some of the other ones later. So I want to draw your attention to this area that I've circled. This is Lake Melville in cent central Labrador. And during the March, hopefully you can see my cursor, during the March sea ice maximum, where there's heavy pack ice all along the coast, there's actually a local minimum. There's a, a relatively low area of sea ice in the mouth of Hamilton, of Lake Melville and Grosswater Bay in Hamilton Inlet. So this is a zoom in on that region. Um, Hamilton Inlet is also known as, or consists of Lake Melville, which is not a lake, it's an inland sea. Um, connected through the Narrows to Grosswater Bay, which is a bay on, of the Labrador Sea. This is also uh, traditionally known as Ivyktuk, meaning place of the walrus. And it would have a name in Inuaymun that I'm not familiar with. And actually maybe, maybe Robert knows the name and he can let, let us know after, after the end of this talk. Um, this is a subarctic fjord and it's one of the southernmost points of semi-annual sea ice cover in the world with substantial coastal land fast ice, as you can see, but also a polynia, an area of open water within the sea ice that's open year round. And as such, it's, it's, a, it's a notably Inuit place. And I'll come back to that in a few slides. There's major river inputs to the region. So most notably the Churchill River all the way up at the top end at the bottom of, of Lake Melville discharges about 1,800 cubic meters per second of fresh water into Lake Melville per year. And Lake Melville is quite deep, reaching up to 300 meters in places, but the, the Rigolet Narrows uh, are shallow on the order of 30 to 50 meters and, and, and narrow. And so it's a, it's a strong constriction on how that lake is connected to the open ocean. This is looking along the axis of the, of the inlet. So the Churchill River is coming in on the left and the Labrador Sea is to the right. And we can see the surfaces on the top and the bottom of the lake or the depth is towards the bottom. And uh, the left panel is showing temperature, red or being warmer. And you can see the surface waters towards the Churchill River, this is in summer, are relatively warm, kind of uh, separated from the cold waters deeper in Lake Melville. And the salinity, the salt content of the water is also fresher from that freshwater input near the surface, and it gets saltier as we get close to the Labrador Sea. Um, and you can see a bit of very salty Labrador seawater spilling over that Rigolette narrow sail into, into Lake Melville. The flow here, just outside the, uh, the Rigolette Narrows, um, this is data courtesy of Brad DeYoung, shows that on average, this is the black line, we have outflow in the surface about 30 meters and then inflow below that. So that's a classic estuar, estuary flow. But I want to draw your attention to the bars around that. That's the, the variability when it, it's never equal to the mean, it's always changing about that. And near the surface, the variability is so strong that actually occasionally we have inflow. Um, the variability is, is almost two meters per second in range. And that's due to the tides. That, that constriction of the narrows um, really amplifies and rectifies the tides in the region to the degree that the, the ice is always mobile. And that's why the region is, in part, the region is kept ice free year round. Now, the upper Churchill River was dammed at Churchill Falls in the early 1970s. And this flattened the seasonal cycle of freshwater discharge into the lake. So the, basically the springtime peak of, of freshwater discharge was reduced and the wintertime minimum was increased. So we have a much more, not perfectly, but much more even flow of freshwater into the lake throughout the year. And 
uh, local knowledge in the Rigolet area associates this development with changes in the local sea ice conditions. And I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Now, the lower Churchill River is currently being dammed at Muskrat Falls for additional hydro development. And I know there is concerns in the community for what effect that development will have. So this leads to a couple of research questions. What is the role of changing river runoff due to hydroelectric development on physical oceanography and sea ice conditions in Hamilton Inlet? And how can we, or can we, use both scientific knowledge and Inuit knowledge to understand this system? So at this point, I wanna pause and step back um, and tell a couple, a couple stories. So first, in 1977, the Labrador Inuit Association filed a land claim for part of what is Labrador on behalf of Labrador Inuit. And Canada and, and the province of Newfoundland said in response to that, well, prove it, meaning prove that this is your land, that you occupy it and use it and have done so for generations. To Inuit, Inuit this was obvious, but to Canada and Newfoundland, it was not. But the unspoken footnote of that statement of we'll prove it is that, well, we only accept certain kinds of proof, meaning the kinds of proof that um, Canadian courts would accept, those courts being a product of Canadian and ultimately Western culture. So Labrador Inuit embarked on a process of documenting use and occupancy of Northern Labrador, making extensive use of maps and interviews with Inuit all along the coast of Northern Labrador. And this study is published as our footprints are everywhere. That's published in the 70s. It's the front page you can see on the left there, and was foundational to the settlement of the uh, Labrador Inuit land claims agreement, which is what led to the creation of Nunatsia in Northern Labrador. Now, importantly, I want to make the point here that this study and its effect on the land claim did not change the perspectives by Labrador Inuit of our own relationship to the land. Rather, it documented this relationship, this knowledge, in a manner, a language, we might say, that the courts could understand. Now, second story. In 2018, I was attending the CMOS annual meeting. I think it was in Halifax. I think it was in Halifax that year. And I was sitting at a table after a session with a colleague, a senior colleague during one of the meeting sessions. And I was describing an idea that I had where we could validate numerical computer ocean models using using local indigenous knowledge as an alternative to seeking out scientific observations or in addition to doing that. Um, and the response from my colleague was a flat and dismissive, well, that's not real data. And the comment wasn't made in a way that we could open a dialogue around, well, what is the nature of that knowledge? Um, how might we dialogue with that knowledge from a scientific perspective? It was rather from the perspective of, well, that's just not good science. And at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what to make of the comment, but it, since I've, I've interpreted it in a manner similar to how the Canadian courts interpreted the land claims by Labrador Inuit to, to say, well, prove that it's your land. And so I, in, in, in thinking about it that way, well, I thought I could set out to do, or we could set out to do something similar, which is to document that knowledge in a way that science can understand it, essentially. So we set out to do that. Um, the process by which we did it was using participatory mapping and interview methods. And this has been done for the Rigolet and Hopedale areas in 2019 and the Makovic, Postville and Nain areas in 2021. So the method here is to create very large maps and you can see some examples on the photo in the top right, that's for the Nain area. Um, with the area of the maps defined, informed by, um, the basically the footprint of the community use drawing on our footprints are everywhere and other uh, knowledge mapping exercises so that the maps were representative and so not just taken as the convenient square from whatever standard mapping system but were representative of actually the community use community area of use and they were printed out very large as you can see community members were invited um, to come out walk on the maps and mark directly on the map to the Sharpies, their knowledge of coastal ocean currents, ice conditions, travel routes, important places, and any changes, including attributions of those changes. 
We also did semi-structured in, semi structured interviews um, where additional richness beyond the simple map data was provided and, and was linked to the map. So any kind of stories or complex um, conceptual understandings of the system could be linked to the kind of raw decontextualized data on the map. The maps were then scanned, digitized, and georeferenced, and the interviews were transcribed. And as I said, code, we used codes to, to link, link things. Um, I want to give a shout out to Brianna Bishop, photo in the bottom left there, who's a student working with me. And she's really been the one leading this process um, in collaboration with folks at the Nunat Sabred government, as well as community members in the various communities who've done the work. So some of the effects of this method are that it's quite, first of all, it's quite immersive. The large maps, um, while not the same as being actually being out on the land, give you a bit more of an immersive sense of, of, of seeing the perspective of the islands and the coast, more so than a, a small tabletop map. And it also facilitates group mapping that you can see kind of in the top middle, whereby multiple participants can map at the same time. And that invites a kind of validation of knowledge process where they communicate amongst each other before marking down anything. It also allows for public participation, including across generations, which is really, really powerful to see. And ideally it's non-prescriptive. So we don't ask people to mark something specific where that specific thing might be defined from science, but rather allow people to express knowledge, express things in, in, in the form that's relevant to them so that what gets represented, the how, even the time scales, what the seasons are, um, is defined from local perspective rather than from the outside. So this is what the final digitized and georeferenced map for the Rigolet area looks like. Uh, so Rigolet is kind of in the middle of the map. <clears throat> the bl big blue area is area that's mapped as open water year round. So open even during the sea ice season. The gray area would be area of relatively unsafe ice. And then everything else is sort of inferred as safe ice. Um, the blue lines are ocean currents, including direction and a qualitative measure of strength. And the orange and green lines are summer and winter travel routes. And it's important to keep those travel routes on here along with the ocean and ice information because it provides the context of the manner in which that knowledge is obtained. It's, it's the use of the land, the occupancy of the land, the being out there hunting and traveling to actually know those things. So there's actually a co-location of where, where the sort of knowledge of the ocean and sea ice exists with places that are used and traveled. That bottom left corner, you can see some hatching. I'm gonna zoom in there. So that's uh, just in Lake Melville from the Narrows. Here is where participants indicated that the sea ice conditions changed over time. Um, prior to the 1970s, prior to the construction of the, the hydro dam at Churchill Falls, there were a number of areas that are open water year round, and those would have been important uh, hunting areas, even through the winter and spring. And then after 1970s, the area is consistently iced over. Older residents will consider it to be bad ice for traveling, unsafe ice, while younger residents, in fact, don't even consider it different from surrounding areas at all. So substantial changes to the ice regime. So then stepping back and thinking about what science could bring to the table, um, we developed a coupled numerical, so a computer model to simulate the ocean and the sea ice in the region. Um, I would like to recognize Kyoko Ahashi and Jinyu Sheng's research group at Dow University for providing the underlying model codes that, that this configuration was based on. So this model has realistic atmospheric weather forcing, offshore ocean forcing, and tides, and river discharge at all the rivers and streams I indicated earlier could be included in the model, meaning we could simulate and did so the region under both pre-Churchill Falls runoff conditions and post Churchill Falls conditions to see, well, what is the effect on the sea ice and the ocean um, due to that change? <laughs> so this is a comparison of the mapped Inuit knowledge and the numerical ocean model simulations for ocean currents. So the simulated current speeds are shown as the green shading 
with the color bar on the right showing you the uh, magnitude of the current speed. And there's pretty, there is good agreement with between the simulated current speeds and the mapped local knowledge of current speeds, which are shown as the blue lines of various thicknesses. Um, Current paths are kind of directed along the the um, the dominant coastline direction and and are amplified in straits between islands. And we see strongest current speeds exceeding a meter per second through rigolet narrows, which is consistent with what locals mapped. Turning to sea ice, again, there's general agreement between model predictions and mapped local knowledge. So the map on the right shows a uh, model simulated sea ice, and it's shown here as the probability of landfast ice. So landfast ice is, is ice that is fixed in place to the land, so it's not moving. Um, and that is the main platform by which travel by skidoo, by sled is facilitated. So white would be 100% probability of landfast ice, blue would mean 0%, so mobile ice or open water. And so you can see areas of essentially open water or packed ice through rigolet narrows and in some of those straits between the islands in Lake Melville, which is um, maps well onto the areas that were mapped by participants as being either open water or, or, or less, less likely to be safe fast ice areas. Now, if we turn to what the model simulations tell us about changes between the river runoff after the hydroelectric dam development and prior to the hydroelectric dam development, again, we get good agreement. So the, the top left map is the one you saw before comparing current speeds. The top right map is the change that the model predicts after the Churchill Falls um, hydroelectric dam was, was developed. And we see uh, decreases of current speeds of up to about 15 centimeters per second throughout the narrows and into Grosswater Bay. And this is consistent with what participants said, um, in particular about the, this area here called the run, the eastern part of the Rigolet Narrows, as, as having observed these changes um, by being out on the water. And also the salinity in Lake Melville increased, again, consistent with local observations. So one resident who um, his, was, was raised and grew up in Mulligan, which is up in, in um, Lake Melville, said that in early times, you could, the water there was fresh, you, you could drink it. And now it's, quote, as salty as out here, out here referring to the Rigolet area. And so um, that is indicating a kind of intrusion of higher salinity water from offshore due to this change in, uh, in river runoff. So that's an example of one way of trying to bring some of these ingredients together and do this bridging work. So we've worked with, well, scientific theory, that's the basis for that model, that numerical model. And we've worked with multi-generational traditional knowledge via the mapping exercises. And the boundary object in this case is the map. The maps are the way with, with the, the the manner with which we can actually communicate these different knowledge systems together. You could also look at this as we will sea ice could be a boundary object in this process, ocean currents also. Um, I also want to highlight the importance of relationships in this process and community and culture. And that's the, those are really key for the, the mapping process to really be uh, successful and meaningful. So now I want to go a little more briefly through some other activities. Uh, that I've been involved in. First, throughout the, those mapping and interview sessions um, with Inuit all along the Labrador coast, uh, certain individuals express a very complex understanding of how the ice system along the coast works. So one example is for the area near Makovic, just south of Makovic, um, a number of participants expressed an understanding of how the seasonal cycle of that landfast ice varies um, and what are the things that drive it. So for example, this idea of the quote ice making months was expressed a number of times. So this would be the overlap between the darkest time of year in late fall and the coldest time of year in winter, uh, December, January. And the idea here is that 
during those ice making months, that's when you need to get the right conditions for, for making ice. So very cold weather, often still calm nights where the bays can catch over, and then the ice can start to form. And if you don't get that, which is starting to happen more often due to increased uh, storminess in the fall, um, you, you, you miss the ice making months. And, and as it was expressed to us, it doesn't matter how cold it gets in March, the days are too long. So you're competing against sunlight. And then you can never quite get there. So there's this combination of the right time of year for making ice with changes to the climate, changes to the storm activity, meaning you can kind of miss this window of creating the right, creating the right ice. Um, and, and this time of year is so important because when there is good sea ice, this is time for travel by sled. When there's open water, it's also a good time for travel by boat. It's the seasons in between, especially that long and less predictable fall season, which um, can really isolate people in communities when travel is not possible or travel is uh, the conditions for travel are less predictable. So what's neat with this, um, from my perspective, is that um, what was expressed could be understood from a science perspective. So in fact, you could, you could take that and build a scientific model and science could come up with that independently, although it might take a very long time. So this is a great example of where the Inuit knowledge could provide a starting point that science could build a predictive model around. And then we, could, then we can start to say, well, what happens if we change things, which we are concerned with, with long-term climate change. So here's an example, again, of taking scientific theory and multi-generational traditional knowledge and understanding them both together through some kind of boundary work. In this case, the sea ice forms the boundary. A scientific theory can understand that through, you know, sea ice dynamics and thermodynamics and mechanics and the multi-generational knowledge. Inuit knowledge understands that through the, the knowledge that's built up through the practice of being and, and living on that, on, that, on that space. Now, in addition to having that long-term knowledge, Inuit also observe in the contemporary sense, as I outlined at the beginning. And we're working with local experts in Nunatsiava to record their observations of the environment, observations rooted in and referencing local traditional knowledge. So um, Emma Harrison is, is leading this work and Ron Webb and Gus Dicker are observers that are also working with us on this. So they, they provide regular observations and I've just thrown up a couple examples here. I won't go through them all, but I'll give you one. I'll read part of that 11th of February one. So these are observations that are contributed to us regularly. We're building up a database. Land fast ice is forming good to the north now, but not much rough ice. So it's getting broken while with the sea rises up. Heavy seas on the outside, if you don't have much rough ice for the seas to break upon when they rise due to storm surges, the waters will break down the land fast ice. No one has gone north yet, e.g. to Hebron, but as soon as someone does go, a lot of people will follow them if they make it. Two routes overland, Ukak, and the other is almost all over the sea ice. So here we can see um, kind of weather information, sea ice information in a way, but expressed in a way that links everything with an understanding of how the system works, the links between uh, the sea state offshore with the land fast ice, and also links to place, right? Hebron, Okak are mentioned specifically, and they're mentioned because they're to be traveled to, and that's why there's knowledge of that. Um, and sometimes these observations also include uh, connections with what science would understand to be the ecosystem, um, there's an example of that on the bottom left about land being covered in ice and, and animals are una unable to find food. So this is an example of multi-generational knowledge and contemporary observations by Inuit being used together with a deep reliance on relationships to make that work. Um, currently, it's, this is very new work. Um, we're not quite sure how this can work with science but it does seem to be a very novel and interesting um, uh, avenue it, that's bringing, bringing people's observations out in a, in a way that maybe they can be used because even decision-making by uh, uh, indigenous governments have often privileged scientific observations and knowledge over, over indigenous observations and knowledge. So if we can find a way to bring that, those observations and knowledge out 
um, and give them give them voice, we can help influence decisions. Now, there's also room, of course, for traditional scientific measurements. So, along with the big group of people I've shown on the left, um, we are undertaking community-based monitoring of the coastal ocean. So this is using the sea ice, which as I mentioned is persisted for about, is persistent for about half the year, perhaps just under half the year, depending on where you are, to access the coastal ocean. So to get it on the coastal ocean, on the sea ice, and then measure the ocean using CTDs like the one shown on the right there, um, to do profiles of temperature and salinity, measure snow and ice thickness. And there's a number of other associated activities measuring noise under the ice and um, really novel ways of measuring plankton without actually physically towing, like an in-place plankton tow that can fit through an ice hole. And this is really reliant on the Inuit research coordinators that are full-time employees on a university research project. And they are community-based um, positions and they undertake field work with support from local knowledge field experts or locals in their communities with the knowledge of the, the when and where to get out and if not to go out if the conditions are poor as well as uh, university based partners <coughs> now this has been going on for I think three CI seasons COVID has been challenging in a way for field work but it's also been an opportunity to try to develop a more honestly community-based approach. If the, if the Southern-based researcher can't fly in and do the work, it means you have to do things a bit more community-based. And one of the big, I would say, successes that we've had is um, collaboratively, de um, collaboratively developing our fieldwork plans. So community by community, separately, we've had fieldwork planning sessions where representatives from the Nunatsiavut government, uh, local interested parties, community knowledge holders, interested scientists, and our research coordinators gather together and we discuss where might be valuable places to undertake these measurements. And to do so, we need to take into consideration, well, what is existing work going on, either by the Nunatsiavut government or Fisheries and Oceans Canada or whoever, um, but also what are areas of community value and interest, and that could be areas that are of concern because they're changing or areas because areas of interest because they're heavily used, they're near important places or they're fishing areas, but also places that are of scientific value and scientific interest, and then overlapping this with what's feasible and what's safe. And so that has, has really guided this, this community-based monitoring work. So this is an example of work that's really rooted in scientific observations, right? We're doing traditional scientific um, uh, monitoring, but we're relying on local knowledge to help inform the kind of the where and the when, um, so that we're not just doing, let's measure where the scientist thinks is most useful to measure based on where the literature, scientific literature says we what we should do next, but rather what is the community interested in and how can we work together to make the measurements most useful, which is so why I've highlighted relationships here, because that's so critical to that work being successful. Um, and of course, doing the activity based on the land, um, it, having the research coordinators be out doing the work on their own land, I think is very important for building that kind of motivation and connection to the actual data being collected. So on the point of land-based based activities, the last, the last item I want to talk about are on the land research workshops. So these are, um, we've been exploring the role that these kind of land-based activities can play in the overall research process. So I participated in a land-based research workshop in 2019. And then in 2021, I was involved in organizing one, one that you see photographed here in just outside the Rigolet area. So I'll talk about this specific workshop. So the aim here was to bring together a diverse group of people to discuss research and, and knowledge of the coastal environment and climate change, and to do so away from the quote, the boardroom. So participants included researchers from outside the region, 
uh, local Inuit knowledge experts, researchers from and staff from the Nunatsiavut government, our research coordinators, and local community members that were not otherwise involved in research but were interested in participating in the conversations. So the idea is that oftentimes if a researcher comes to a community, a small community, and wishes to speak about research, unintentionally, if that takes the form of putting up slides or putting up a poster or doing something that that researcher in a form that the researcher is comfortable with unintentionally that gives that researcher some power because they're standing at the front of the room speaking in a way that they're comfortable doing so and and often when we speak at say academic conferences we we are intending to project confidence and knowledge and power in doing that but it it doesn't lead to a level power relation between the researchers and the community. So the idea with these land-based research workshops is to take that conversation out of that space and put it somewhere like in a cabin, in a tent, on the land where we can level those power relationships. So for this particular workshop, we had uh, sessions over two days and an overnight on local grass work and how that's connected to the local environment and climate change. Um, mapping of Inuit environmental knowledge and, and use and occupancy of land, underwater noise measurements and a demonstration of how that works, social perceptions of hydroelectric developments, wildlife management, fisheries, and oceanography. And this workshop intended to, and these workshops intend to foster linkages um, within community between community and external researchers, between researchers that might not otherwise find themselves speaking about certain topics in a particular place. And also across generations, you can see uh, a number of children were present at this particular workshop, which is really, a, it was actually a really wonderful experience. And they, they, they contributed a lot to the, to the mood of that space by being there and asking questions, participating. So the, the point of this is not, this could very easily be, well, let's go out on the land to a great place and talk about research. And that's the end of it. And everyone that goes to these workshops, of course, comes away saying, that was really wonderful. Let's do more of those. But if we ask the question, well, what, what do these actually do? What, what, what work do they do in the research process? That's not yet 100% clear. So we're actually doing research on these research workshops. So data the, the, the workshops themselves were recorded in a way, data is collected. At the end of each day, there was a reflection session where um, participants reflected on the day and the conversations. Um, all participants completed a follow-up questionnaire, an interview, and there were debriefs with all the various organizing, uh, organizing people. And so that, that, those records provide data from which we can ask questions you know, what kind of work does do, do these workshops do? Do these help with communicating research back to community? Do these help with fostering relationships between community and research researchers? Do they help connect researchers with each other? Do they help communities have certain conversations about work that's being done in their area? Some of those things may be done more or less. And so that's what we'd like to learn from these activities. So this, these land-based workshops are very much a process component of this research. So uh, obviously they're based on the land um, and they're rooted in relationships. These are all about having conversations. Community and culture are so important. Um, these are all, uh, we ate local country food at these workshops and, and just simply rather than being at a boardroom or an academic conference center where you don't need to worry about how you're going to stay warm, for example, um, having that being out of that comfort element where you don't have that kind of power and you need to rely on local community and cultural experts really helps set a particular tone. And, and again, it's all about boundary work. In order to have any conversation with people that have different, different worldviews or just different experiences, we have to find these points of contact, contact um, these boundary points that we can have, uh, build a relationship and have the conversations around. So what I've done here is I've simply overlaid on top of each other all of the different um, linkages that I've touched on separately throughout the talk. And hopefully you can see that there are many ways and multiple ways to connect all of these different components um, to do this kind of 
really, I think, important and interesting bridging work, bridging of knowledge systems work. But I do want to point out that what I'm speaking about today, I'm, I don't mean to present this as, oh, I've, you know, we've figured it out. <laughs> this is just reflections on my experiences over the last few years of, of working in this space. There are many people um, working on similar activities and have figured out different ways of doing this. And this is very much an ongoing, ongoing process. But I, did, I do think it's good within our community, the more uh, scientific community, I mean, the more um, mathematical and physical oriented aspects of science where I don't think we think about this as much as other disciplines to bring this to bring this forward. And so with that, I will end. Um, I just want to finally say one line, I won't read this whole slide, just to say that this work um, is not possible in the remotest sense without broad collaborations and, and relationships that include community members and the Nazi-Arab government, uh, other academic partners, community-based research coordinators, and of course, students and postdocs that work with me and funders. And with that, I will end and I think, well, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. That was fascinating. I love listening to you. It's a wonderful story. Um, I'd like uh, folks to feel comfortable um, entering any questions into the Q&A box uh, on the lower part of your screen. And while we are waiting for some questions, as Eric mentioned, uh, this is one way of doing things, and he described his story. I'd invite Robert now to, um, maybe you could um, stop sharing there. Uh, Eric, thank you. I'd invite Robert to share a few thoughts on his experience working in the community, complimentary way, because I think most a lot of your work is on the terrestrial side and climate side. So I'd, uh, Certainly turn it over to you, uh, Robert, and share some of your experiences and any complimentary perspectives on what Eric shared. Well, I wanted, it's tough to follow that up. I gotta say that was very, uh, very good and interesting. And, you know, obviously a lot of uh, work has been done in the last few years that uh, has really taken those projects in really exciting directions. So I think that's really cool. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, it's, it's kind of a bit, <laughs> it's kind of a bit, uh, my, my path to being a, a prof and doing work in, in my or, um, I was kind of a reluctant path to end up doing kind of research work. And I can say that uh, genuinely kind of been figuring it out as, as you go along. I started doing kind of just doing work on glaciers in, in Northern Labrador and that was you know about as far removed from community in certain respects but you you do spend that that was kind of for when I started doing a master's degree it was kind of the, the chance to go up and and do work on glaciers and kind of this these areas that growing up in in Labrador you never really uh thought you'd get a chance to, to ever see and so you're you kind of feel lucky about that and it's it's only in starting to do work up there and um you you spend a lot of time around other people from labrador and inuit in particular um who would be spending time every summer at the base camp and then some people would be joining you visiting sites and doing work with glaciers and all that and it started to make me want to think more about how coming from the terrestrial side i could maybe work and in a, in a field that maybe had more relevance to to communities themselves and um i actually nearly took a, a job in doing wildlife work and it's kind of fortuitous it well fortuitous depending on one's perspective i was probably a couple days away from uh from taking a particular job doing caribou work with the torngat secretariat at some point so it's uh, interesting to be on this path in, in an academic world versus um Doing that kind of stuff but uh i ended up doing a my phd and working on on permafrost work in, in labrador primarily and um the thing about permafrost is in labrador there hadn't really been from the kind of western science perspective much work done on it really at all i mean there there was you know knowledge that 
people individually in communities or people doing work related to infrastructure or people doing work related to building roads or, you know, all these these individuals who may have, you know, had scattered observations or who, you know, knew about things going on, but, you know, none of that was fine, had found its way into kind of the broader academic world. And, and what we started to see at some points was things like a major resource project would happen and they would say, see, the, uh, the literature says there's no permafrost in Labrador, so we don't need to consider it in our environmental assessment. Um, stuff like that would start to happen. And um, then, you know, they would find out the hard way that sometimes that that can be a, a real major concern. And so one of the earliest things in, in when I was doing my PhD, we started to do some work with the new Nazi government on permafrost around the community of Nain. Um, Nain is a, a rapidly growing community and it's actually like really limited because it's, it's mountainous and, um, you know, there is a lot of concerns about permafrost. And, and so really us going up and trying to do some work to help basically help them with the idea of, you know, uh, we know there's permafrost concerns. Nobody's done any work here. We want to work with you to pick spots where we plan to build and maybe um, get some better knowledge about what to expect in those areas and try to use that in, into the future. And so that's kind of some of the first exposure to those things. And now over time, you know, we've I've kind of branched off since becoming kind of my own independent researcher and, and branched off in other ways so that we're working um, with other partners as well in, in Labrador focused on things like even bake apples uh, or sorry um, cloudberries and uh, they're linked to certain types of permafrost environments and um, those kinds of environments during some interviews a few years back on, on one of the projects we were involved with people were saying how these environments were changing in response probably to climate change and, and people were describing the changes they saw and, and that sort of stimulated an interest in, in trying to better understand how much of a risk there is to these really culturally important areas. And um, I think that, so this is a long winded way of saying that um, I think I've kind of gone from topic to topic based on you know, conversations with people, time spent with people, interests um, from different community members or uh, or even, you know, Inuit government representatives. And, and that's kind of shaped the direction I've, I've gone. It hasn't been a quite a coherent straight line path and um, going from glaciers to permafrost to now, you know, some ecology stuff to snow and, you know, everything in between. It's, but, you know, it's found a way to be able to spend more time home and more time with people from home and more time, um, you know, hopefully doing some types of work that, that can help us better understand the way things are changing and, and even maybe how, how to respond to change in the future. Um, one of the examples of something that, you know, completely out of my specific area, but at some point I, I got involved a little bit in, in work related to a, a flood event uh, that impacted the community of Mud Lake. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of concerns that it was due to the development of hydroelectric uh, uh, operations on, on the Churchill River. And, um, you know, none of the work related to that ever, ever became anything in a scientific sense, but from a community sense, I felt at least comfortable in saying that I, you know, tried to help them advocate on their behalf about their concerns, um, and that's, I guess, you know, just uh, not everything has to be about, <laughs> you know, the the Western science perspective on things as well, right? And I think that's how I've tried to move forward through it. But it, you know, it's a challenging thing, and and we'll probably get to this in the Q and A and and just in general. Um, it, it can be a very circuitous path and, and there's a lot of demands on, on researchers who are from the North in a lot of different ways and it kind of pulls you in a lot of different directions. And so 
Um, you know, you try to do right by your people, but it, you know, it, it's always hard to, to maintain a balance between um, the, the different kinds of worlds, right? Thank you, Robert. We talked to uh, Eric and I, and uh, uh, Doug talked about that challenge uh, a few days ago with respect to the academic expectations of research uh, versus the traditional relationships, relationship and building that you and Eric certainly have done in the North. And I love the story about your career because if we look back, believe me, I look back on my career and it's a bunch of forks in the road and you choose forks very much based on relationships you make. And, and, and that's what makes looking back actually quite rewarding. So I, uh, I congratulate you. And as a non-Indigenous person who does work in the North, I'd like uh, to ask Doug to share a few words from his perspective working in uh, Arctic communities. Uh, Thanks, Jim. Uh, some 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 hard acts and some uh, some some uh, hard company to follow up on. But uh, I, I I was really intrigued, Eric, uh, by a whole lot of things in your talk, and I I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, thinking about what you, what you presented and Robert, what you just described, and kind of my own journey, um, there there's some there's some definite parallels here. And I'm another person who has not had a a single or simple linear career path at all, uh, either outside or inside academia. But um, there's a, there's a there's some really intriguing parallels across a whole lot of fields right now. The fields that you guys have described. Uh, I work in wildlife uh, coal management and do a lot of wildlife human conflict work these days. And in in our in northern contexts in Canada, everybody's trying. Well, mostly everybody is trying to kind of, you know, figure out what the right thing is and how to do it and how to get there. And there's all kinds of interesting parallel learning. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the great features of the Northern research community is that it tends to be fairly multidisciplinary and people do tend to have a lot of connections with folks in other fields. And so there's, you know, there's probably greater ease for that kind of learning to take place. But listening to you both, I was hearing a lot of, of pretty resonant stuff with Things that I've done with folks in northern Manitoba, the Kivalik region, uh, and and particularly in the southwest Yukon, uh, and you, you've got to be kind of multidisciplinary. And uh, uh, before I was faculty here at the U of S, I was um, I was a postdoc and uh, scholar in residence at Yukon College up in Whitehorse. And uh, so, as as a northern based researcher, even a non indigenous one, Robert, I you know I had the similar, hey, can you help us with this? Like, yeah, you say yes. You know, it's uh, it's, uh, it's just kind of what you do, especially earlier in your, in your career as you're trying to figure it all out and, and, and make it all work. So it, it's so interesting, though, seeing <clears throat> that this parallel learning is taking place with, with people in all kinds of different situations. You know, you're up in, up in Goose Bay. Um, people are in different places and, and things have ended up more uh, mixed around uh, during and post pandemic. So my my hope and i'd actually even bet on it is that we're kind of on the on the cusp of a big burst of learning uh from one another about all of the different things that people have been trying during the pandemic uh and i think that's probably going to be a very axial moment in northern research as uh communities and you know the growing northern post-secondary educational sector and the growing northern and northern based research community gets its feet under it and is maturing and saying, yeah, you know, we're going to be doing it this way. Thank you very much. Um, I think Southern institutions are going to have some really interesting um, realizations and, and, and uh, awakenings and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully they, they, they respond in a good way. And, uh, and I, I, I don't expect that um, in very short order, the, the Southern and Northern uh, the classic Southern and Northern roles are going to necessarily look the same as they have. Uh, and uh, it's going to be different. Some stuff's going to be better, probably. Some stuff may not be better. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't expect it's all going to be perfect. Um, but, uh, but the opportunities to, you know, what you guys have talked about, to me, 
uh, highlights the value of creating further and more diverse opportunities to learn from one another as we all try to adapt to you know accelerating climate change continuing social change um you know pandemics and other stressors that are going to torque all kinds of things um very abruptly in all kinds of ways thinking back to amanda lynch's plenary yesterday morning um you know i'm not sure how many people had uh, geopolitics on their uh on their radar um, before February uh, in the ways that we've had to since for a very, very long time. A few people did. Uh, and if Rob Hubert is out there, Rob, um, I'm, I hope people are finally listening to you. Um, but there's there's all kinds of stuff out there. And, and the better job we can do learning from one another as we all try and, you know, do right, um, you know, the better it'll go. And uh, Eric and Robert, to you both, Nakoma, uh, really, really, Happy to hear what you had to say today. Thanks very much, Doug. Uh, very nice words. Um, before we, we, we don't have any questions from the audience, but I do have one question before we, we close. Um, an hour and a half, first of all, has gone by very quickly. Um, but Ada is our um, Zoom coordinator tonight, and I think she's our student. Um, rep at CMOS. I was talking to her today about some work she's doing in the north and about community monitoring. And the question, I won't uh, ask Ada to ask a question, but what I would like is I feel blessed that we have Robert and Eric involved with CMOS um, and, and of Inuit descent. But my question to Robert and Eric is, the relationships you develop with young people in the north, what are some of the challenges and opportunities and what are the things CMOS can do to help um, young people in the north um, consider careers in atmosphere, ocean, not necessarily only academic careers, but also government science careers and government science de desperately needs uh, better representation from um, certainly Indigenous and African Canadians and others. So I'd like uh, Eric and Robert to share your thoughts on student engagement. Yeah, that's a good question, Jim. I mean, I think one, one comment I'd make on it, maybe not so much specifically student engagement, but engagement with a younger generation demographic, let's say, would be having community based positions that are that support community based a community based nature i mean i've noticed with the, some of the research we've been doing where we have these full time positions with people on a research project but they're and they're you know, dalhousie research assistants quote unquote but they live in communities in the so 100% full time and they participate in the project that way that is so i don't want to speak for them but i feel that it is so enabling for them and it doesn't put up a lot of the barriers that are often put up when someone thinks, well, I, want, I would like to work in an environmental research way, but I need to move to St. John's or move to Halifax or something, which is a big obstacle for so many ways. So supporting some ways of supporting yeah, community based positions, I would say, is hot, hot on that list. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously agree that those types of positions are, I think, pretty helpful. I think there's a lot of different ways. One of the challenges that you run into right at the outset is, I mean, that that works really well when you have people who envision that they um, they would do that type of thing. and They have an interest in that type of thing. Sometimes it's a, you know, uh, sometimes it's just a matter of also having exposure to that these opportunities exist. It's, you know, having those people in the community means that you think about this might be the kind of thing I could do in the in, in the future as well. I mean, nobody growing up back home was a climate scientist. There was, you know, there there was a very limited number of, of jobs you could envision you, you would do and you go out to somewhere to university and you suddenly um, see this huge range of other things that people do. And um, so those types of positions can be really helpful with that. I, I'm a big proponent of, I think, having um, 
educational, whether it be campuses or, you know, satellite campuses or institutions in the north plays will play a really big role for a whole bunch of different reasons, but also, you know, ensuring that that they offer kind of a kind of a broad range of programs and a broad range of opportunities there. And I think that's something that helps people to be able to envision different kinds of futures as well. So I think that that's the kind of thing that can be really helpful in addition to the, just have, to having positions in, in various communities, because, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of people who, especially if you look 10, 15 years ago, um, if they had any interest in, in the earth sciences and natural sciences and, and oceanographic and climate, I mean, they are looking at, at St. John's, at Halifax, and Ottawa, at uh, uh, University of Saskatchewan. And, he, you know, they, they, there was no northern institutions that really offered opportunities in these domains to the degree that um, that hopefully the future is, is going to have for, for people. And I think that that'll be a bit of a, a game changer in some ways. Thank you, Robert. I actually do have a question that um, actually somebody um, who's involved with uh, the uh, UN International Telecommunications Union. And I know that I've attended some of their sessions on AI and uh, artificial intelligence. And the question is the use of drones and artificial intelligence perhaps AI as a bridging mechanism between uh, Western knowledge and Indigenous knowledge. Um, any consideration for remote technology like drones and then using uh, high performance computing as a strategy to bridge some of the knowledge systems? Uh, um, any thought to that, uh, Robert or Eric? I can, there's a lot there. I'll, I'll maybe comment on the artificial intelligence, or let's just generally say, you know, computer statistical analyses. I think it can be powerful. Let, let's imagine a situation where you're trying to blend some kind of scientific knowledge with an indigenous knowledge, and you try to you try to blend that computationally. I think it could be powerful, but it could also be quite dangerous because in doing that, you have to do you have to somehow quantify the the indigenous knowledge and so that that process is not agnostic to how you your own worldview right so that that process is going to somehow decontextualize that knowledge in some way that might not be that might might be useful although useful to who right so i would be really hesitant about that about that process to be honest great yeah, I don't really have a lot to add to that. I, I agree. I think that that's, um, you know, certainly a, a, a hesitation. And I do know that there are some, certainly some uh, communities in the North, uh, going to the technology side of things, not the AI side of things, that um, there are quite a, a lot of people now from the North who are really embracing some of the new opportunities that that are there with technologies like drones. And so that's been a bit empowering for for some individuals, and especially knowing some people even in in Labrador who've really who created businesses out of um, using these technologies to help um, in their home communities. So that that's a positive side of things. But on on the AI perspective, I, I think you're always making a decision if you're entering into that a bit. Thank you, and certainly our computer models and our prediction systems. Uh, in the weather service, use AI considerably, but not necessarily in this bridging. Um, so I'm going to say a few words, and then I'll ask Joseph if he'd like to have a short closing statement uh, just to share with us before we say goodbye. First, I'd like to thank Eric and Robert and Doug for their wonderful sharing of knowledge today. Our, our public lecture is it's a tradition over the past 10 years and really CMOS is about connecting people and connecting disciplines. That's really what the Congress is all about. And the public talk is about connecting the public with some of the science we do, but it's special tonight because tonight we're bridging 
knowledge systems, indigenous knowledge systems and our traditional scientific systems. That's very unique, but very important. And I think it's a start of something we need to explore more in CMOS. I had a meeting last week with a special interest group, the Arctic special interest group. And we had a really nice talk about this being a focus of CMOS within the Arctic special interest group. But also, and it's funny, uh, uh, both of you talked about activities in the North um, and Robert, I think, you know, having a little kind of a, like a, set, a session or something in the North and Robert or a location in the North to, to do research and, and the workshops in the North that Eric mentioned. And we said, you know, it'd be really cool to have a CMOS in the North. And uh, so certainly it's, it may sound like a stretch, but I think it's something we should, we should think about. Um, and so I thank everybody for their attendance. And uh, before we close and uh, say goodbye, I just like to turn it over uh, to Joseph to share a few final words with us. You're muted, Joseph. Okay, and thank you for the great conversation. Um, to me, it's always like a, an issue of uh, heart and mind, culture versus another culture, you know, worldviews trying to, to uh, I guess, uh, collaborate. Like in our community, in University of Regina, for example, I work with professors over there, and quite a few of them have undertaken to learn Cree, you know, because they want to understand what is behind the language why are they so adamant about learning the language and when they start learning it they realize how how deep that language is how deep the songs are you know how much depth there is and it actually transformed them we have a professor over there we have a spiritual leader um tom i think uh, and he's underta undertaken quite a few scholars to participate in in uh, four-year commitments of Sundance ceremony, for example, sweat lodge ceremony. And if you see those people, talk to those people, if you, if you knew them, where they were at four years before, and you saw them four years later, you'll see a transformation. And to me, that's part of the key. Within, sometimes we don't often know what is indigenization, what is indigenous knowledge, what do they, what they can, what they can they do for Canada, what can they do for the world? And it's at that time now, I guess, you know, to actually become um, tied with us, you know, because we've been waiting. You could say we've been waiting for, thousand, you know, for 500 years. Nobody's been listening. Still people don't listen. I see that in my own community. Like in our backyard, even our own, sp our own indigenous leaders are in bed with Canadian government corporations making really terrible decisions about tree tree planting, you know, and a lot of these uh, indigenous leaders are not connected, or they are connected, but they're not really truly uh, practicing what they're connected with culturally. Like their culture is land-based, it's spiritual-based, you know, it's emotional-based, it's, it's all of that, but somehow they lost that connection, so what do they do? Pfft, Big River First Nation, where my grandmother comes from. Uh, a big corporate company from Europe somewhere hires an indigenous person and he just does the same thing that uh, Macmillan Bledel does, just decimates, you know, um, clear cuts a tree right beside the reserve. Just clear cuts it and you can go there and you can smell death. Like what kind of a indigenization is that? You know, like some, a lot of people are lost this as well. So with what, you know, Eric's talking about and Robert and all of people I hear are very intelligent people. That's who's going to make changes. That's going to create, you know, um, transformation in this, in this country. You know, I, f I find, you know, it's us, but it's the corporations who have to deal with in the governments and the indigenous governments. Those are the ones that are the uh, perpetrators now. They've adopted a system that colonize, a colonizer way of thinking and being, you know, that they think is the right way. Part of it is right. Part of it, we need economic development, you know, but it's not always the answer. Like what I've been told since I was 20 years old is to uh, pay attention to changes in climate. 
the first thing I heard was that all these four elements are going to speed up. And that was about 40 years ago. They're going to speed up. Not everybody wants to, like we, we work with generalizations in a way. You know, we work within just sweeping st statements that old people will tell us. But those were prophecies that they were told. Those were told by their ancestors before that. And all of a sudden, I am here in my first year university, and this old man says, there's going to be a real, like, a speeding up of the water, the wind, the earth, and fire. And that was 40 years ago. And so I watched for the next 30 years. He just planted a seed in my brain, and he just blew my mind. And I thought, wow. 30 years later, I see all that he was talking about was actually true. And how can you explain that to scientists, you know, and governments and politicians? How do you explain that? Like, that's what, uh, you know, Eric and I was listening to. That's something that you're trying to understand, you know, that your people, the Inu elders are, you know, trying to get across. How do you explain something that's very sort of general, like, it's like a, a romanticized version of, the, you know, the way that we think and feel. But that's exactly how we're heart people, right? We feel the land. We feel what's happening. When somebody doesn't listen... We recognize that that person is not ready to listen, to hear what, you know, the traditional knowledge or the spiritual knowledge. They're not ready. They're, they're going to, as a, so what will happen still creates suffering for their own people or they themselves will suffer. That's what happens. Pastahuan is like breaking natural law. And I see it over and over again. Now we're having peat moss problems up in La Ronge, you know, that's the next thing that's happening up there. And people are fighting, you know, don't disturb the peat moss you know this is uh this is already it's okay as it is you don't have to disturb it you know what are you doing you're going to just just destroy the whole ecosystem it's not that animals depend on it you know you're going to alter it but do they listen uh, like it's our own government like saskatchewan our premier they just don't listen they just give all these contracts to their own friends and Brothers and sisters, you know, family members. We see that all the time, over and over again. Trappers trappers are out there. My grandfather was a trapper. And all of a sudden, there's a trap. There's a, somebody doing a prospecting on their land, you know, on their trap land. You say, what the hell's going on? I leased this land for, you know, 10 years. And all of a sudden, there's prospectors looking for minerals and resources. So it's all resource-based. Like, it's really terrible. Like, people are still caught in the physical aspect of this planet, right? They're still caught in the physical thing. They're not looking at spiritual, emotional, and also the social, where hum other humans are still living there. They're, we're still having surveyors come walk in there. They don't notice us. They just keep surveying, and then they don't see the indigenous people. They just keep surveying and surveying. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I've seen, and I still see that today. It's, I'm, I'm, 50, I'm 70 years old, I'm almost, almost 70 years old, and I, I, haven't, I have not I have yet to develop trust I'm starting to with locals, you know, like Candace Savage is a really good friend, and uh, Trevor Harriet. These are really people that I connect with, and I know they will make some effort. And there, we have to, but we have to work together. So you know, those are they haven't even arrived at this old man's prophecy about sinking cities. We're we're heading for that direction where cities are actually going to going to sink into the earth, and that's what this old man told me back in. Uh, 1974 and he was scared the hell out of me i said what do you mean what are you talking about new york you know los angeles all these major cities are just going to just sink in like this that's scary information i carry that and those are prophecies that they carried before that from their own ancestors so you could see how emotional that this issue can be you know for me you know because i've been listening and i've been and i operate as about 50 or 60 percent now operate in the Cree language. So I sometimes feel the anger doesn't come out as much <laughs> when it comes out in my language. My heart comes out, you know, because the language dictates how I feel. But English kind of gets me a little bit wound up at times, you know. I just don't, I'm, I'm dealing with it, you know. I'm trying to be compassionate and, and not be so doomsday, you know. But we are heading to a rough time, so we we have to <laughs> work together. But thank you for inviting me, Doug. You know, to come and say a few words and be part of this conversation. It's a, it's a, it's time. It's time, and we have to work together. Well, thank you, Joseph. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, and thank you for sharing your heart. So, Walalan, uh, merci.
Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, good night. Good night. <laughs> thank you. Good day. Thank you all. Hey, hey Doug, I'll be. Uh, I'm going to go to the garden at uh, Broad.